Good morning, everybody. It is Pastor Matt Stokes. Pretty close to on time for the morning meditation. So hopefully you can join us and also love to have you join us at Coastal Christian. 930 at 2577 Dolls Avenue, Sunday morning. But for now, we are in 1 John, and I'm going to start chapter 2. Jesse did the end of chapter 1 yesterday, and we'll see if we can get a little further today. Um, hopefully you can join us. 1 John is a beautiful book, really simply written. What's amazing is as, as simple as the writing of 1 John is, it's extremely profound and poignant, and so is John. John, when he writes, I think Jesse mentioned, he only has a writing vocabulary, what you call an active vocabulary, of probably about 500 words, and yet John gives us some of the most profound communication regarding who Jesus Christ is. I mean, right, he's the one that talks about how we are the children of God and it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know one day when we are like him, we will see him just as he is, right? That's whoever is, loves God is born of God and knows God. Like, they're powerful words. The, the Gospel of John is where you have John saying, you know, God is like, you know, he is the door, the I am statements, right? You know, I am the good shepherd, all those expressions, they come from, I am the head, right? Those expressions come out of the book of John. So you, there's a lot of depth in John, a, a very mystical type of writer. That's why a lot of us who kind of are cut from that cloth appreciate the way that he writes. So let's take a look at this. We'll pray and we'll jump into 1 John chapter 2 for a few minutes and see what's here for us. Father, as we come before your word again today, we know that your word is like a fire that refines us. It purifies us. Jesus said, sanctify us by your word because your word is truth. And so we pray that the sanctifying work of the scriptures does that work again today. Even right now, we pray and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so chapter 2 of 1 John says this, and then some, we'll probably jump back to one just for a point of some reference, right? Okay, my little children, these things may I write, uh, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay, let me see if I can put this somewhere. That's a pretty powerful thing to say, and, and, and hold on everybody. And here's why. Um, first of all, he calls them little children. That's pretty powerful because he's trying to have an intimacy with them. John, as he writes this, is probably somewhere around 90 years old. And he's the last, as scholars have put the timelines together, he's the last living disciple of those that traveled with Jesus. The last living disciple. So they're coming to... John to understand what it really means to be someone who has a genuine, authentic relationship with Christ because if anybody knows what that is, it would be John himself because he was the last one that actually had that physical contact, that intimacy with Jesus. That's why he says, that which we have seen, that's what we have touched, that's what we have beheld, considering the word of life, our fellowship is with him, right? He was trying to say something about his own exclusivity, that he was one of or the only one, at least the one of the 12, that really has the authority to still speak apostolically into the life of the listeners, of the readers of this book, First John. So he calls them my little children, and he'll use that expression, beloved, uh, or my little children, several times in, in this short book. I'm writing these things unto you uh, so that you may not sin. So why would he say that? Well, because he just got done in First in, in First John chapter one, saying that sometimes we do sin, and if we sin, then he is faithful to, and just to cleanse us from that sin and all unrighteousness if we confess. Right. So why does he say that? Because he knows that we do sin. So he doesn't want us to sin, but if we do sin, we can confess that sin, and if we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse, right? That's there because God wants you to know that your sin is not taking him by surprise, right? He already knows that we struggle with sin. And, and we should struggle. It's a concern if you're not struggling with sin and you're watching this this morning. You've got to ask yourself, 
if you genuinely have a relationship with Christ, that's what he's going to get into here as well. But for most of us, at least those of us who are watching and take the time to be part of the morning meditation, for most of us, we are well aware of our own sin. But an unbeliever, even in these days, who was denying the sin concept, um, really is struggling with having a genuine relationship with Christ. Jesse he says, let me see if I can bring Jesse onto my video. I thought he was at a high school assembly or teaching a class. Hang on, everybody. Hold on. Yes. What's up? Good. Good. I think I can hear your voice this time. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're driving. Oh, okay. So you're cutting in and out, probably because the sound of the truck is trying to take over. Yeah, I'm going to Joe Miller's, and he's gonna help me out. So, all right, nice. I gotta go. Okay. Thanks for tuning tuning in with us. Amen. Subscribe to the channel. <laughs> yeah. Right. Boom. Okay. So, that's where he is. He's actually getting that truck, his old truck, fixed up because he's giving it away to someone who is in need of it. Um, good kid. So, let's get back. Um, so, anyway, we were talking about the concept of sin. Let's keep going because if we stay here too long, some of these things are going to spell themselves out. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? So, in other words... Let me say it again. He's, he's saying, I wrote chapter 1, but don't take this wrong. If we sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us when we confess. But don't take this wrong. It doesn't mean, oh, you should just keep on sinning and you can just keep confessing. He writes, I write these things so that you might not sin. Okay? So, of course, he wants to make the reader understand that sinning is not part of God's plan. Sinning is not something that God wants to see in the scenario, although he has dealt with it. So he says, but, right, you can circle that but, right? If anyone does sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So the advocate, everybody, is another word for an attorney. Some of you probably know that, right? That's another word. And so attorneys are funny, right? Because we have a lot of jokes that we talk about attorneys. There's a rabbi, a priest, and a lawyer, like somewhere all of us know some lawyer joke and those lawyer jokes are there for certain reasons right usually because there's some sort of corruption like we think lawyers really don't have our best intentions in mind they just want to make the commission off the, the uh, off of the the case or what have you so we don't really some not all of us have had good experiences with lawyers or what have you and that makes sense I understand the humor in it all but when you are really in a serious situation and you need an advocate most of us know that that word means somebody that comes alongside like a friend would be considered an advocate someone that's on your side that's the word that's being used here literally in the ancient times this was the word that was being used for advocate uh, for lawyer we have a lawyer so you have a lawyer and you've sinned you've committed a crime and you've got to appear before the great God and universal eternal judge and as you stand before him yeah uh, waiting for uh, you know what say you your, your attorney stands up and says uh, guilty your honor and you're like wait what wait hold on you know I don't want you to say because usually in court you want to do whatever you can to proclaim your innocence and Jesus our advocate actually speaks to your honor and tells him that we're guilty we're guilty on all charges and then um, he says, uh, what's the sentence? And so then our advocate, Jesus Christ, says, uh, permission to approach the bench? So he comes to the bench and he goes, Dad? Right? Because the judge is actually the father of the advocate's son himself. And then he says, I have an idea um, as far as the sentencing in the case and that is that I want to take, I, I took the case for Matt Stokes, but I'm also going to take the charges for Matt Stokes. And it's like, wait, what? Now, a lot of lawyers will take cases, but they don't take the sentencing. Right? But Jesus does. Jesus took the sentencing from the Father, who was the judge. He takes the sentencing, he takes the case, and he takes the charge upon himself which is death 
And so, again, the, the, the cuffs are ratcheted down tight, and the father allows the son to take the sentence, which is death, and Christ is crucified on our behalf so that we could be forgiven and set free. That is the gospel right there. That is the essence of the gospel, is that we were sinners and that sin sentence of death has come down upon us. Jesus Christ steps in as our advocate and says, I will take the sentencing, I will take the charges so that your charges can be dropped. You are guilty, but now you will be set free, justified, and, and that's what justified means means just if I'd never sinned, right? And now I'm going to take your place, and Jesus dies on the cross, and of course we know he rises again to show that the sin penalty that he was paying for is now satisfied. What I'm talking about with you right now, this is the essence of what the gospel is. Anything that you go past in that regard is, is tangential, and some of it's beautiful tangential details about being ambassadors for him, about being adopted into his family. These doctrines are beautiful and wonderful and need to be explored. But the essence of the gospel is that Jesus Christ stepped in as our advocate and took the charge of our case and took the sentences, sentencing of our case, right? So it, it, his name isn't just the advocate. It's actually Jesus Christ the righteous. Right? So imagine this, and John writes this because he wants to let you know that, that your advocate is righteous. We know that God is a just judge, and now you have a righteous advocate. So you can't just, as far as I know, you can't just try a case. You have to go past the bar exam and become part of a guild of people, a society of people who have the right to actually be involved in the advocacy and the defense and the prosecution of cases. And in order to do that, you need to pass a test called the bar exam, okay? And on that test, I've never seen the bar exam, but I would imagine on that test are a lot of questions that are related to law and understanding law and be able to talk within the terminology of law. Well, Jesus, he passed an exam in heaven in order to be a, a, an advocate, and it was the righteous test, okay? Jesus passed the righteous test. That's the bar exam in heaven. You need to be 100% completely, utterly, totally without sin and eternal. So Jesus is infinite and he is righteous. In other words, he's never done wrong. Everything he does is right. What he says is right. What he thinks is right. Where he goes is right. That all actions, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors are completely right. Jesus is the righteous. Could you ask for a better advocate than Jesus? So imagine this, he is with you, he's your lawyer, he's taking on those charges. The sentence should have been death, but he takes it. Now Satan is in this courtroom too, if, you'll, if you're noticing the metaphor. And of course, this must make him furious that Jesus actually stepped in and enabled the Father to drop the charges upon you so that you could be set free. And that's what's happening here. Verse 2 explains it even further it says he that's jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours but also for the sins of the whole world so what is this word propitiation propitiation has the idea of um satisfying god or appeasing god um, um I'm trying to think of here like a, a good example would be like like let's take this into my own life right so you have my parents and um, there are times that I have made my parents very angry because I know I've done something that I should not have done right let's just say that um, uh, there were certain foods in the house that I wasn't supposed to eat because they were for company right there's an Entenmann's cake on the table and I was not supposed to eat it because that was for company when they came and I ate the whole cake and my parents were out and I know they're coming home. So what do I do? I'm only eight years old, so I don't have the ability to go drive to the store and buy another cake. I would do what everyone watching would do right now. You would do whatever you could do within the sphere of your home in order to propitiate their anger, wrath, disappointment, judgment, right? So company's coming, okay, I ate the cake. 
What I'm going to do though is I'm going to clean the whole house. So that when my parents get home and they feel that there's a lot of cleaning that needs to get done, they're going to say, I can't believe Matthew ate the cake, but that's okay because what's more important is he cleaned the whole house. And you're hoping that that the cleaning, the righteous act of the cleaning propitiates the anger of your parents because you ate the Entenmann's bun cake or what have you. Do you see that? That's a simple example of propitiate. What happened with Jesus? He satisfied, if you will, the wrath of his father. He propitiated it. He satisfied it. He appeased it by taking the sin that had to be paid for and placing it upon himself that when he did that that was called propitiation it's a big theological word you see now and then i'm surprised to see it in john but it is it is a concept that was understood by the people of ancient times not only in courts of law but when they made sacrifices to their gods usually they thought that their gods were angry it's interesting if you read the ancient gods they always seem to be angry with the people and the, their worshipers are always trying to uh, propitiate them and so he's using a concept that was very familiar to his readers at that time and he's saying that jesus is the great righteous propitiator of the whole world right not only of just us but for us who believe but also for the whole for the sins of the whole world so if the, so here comes the theological question and maybe we'll leave it here and i'll come back and we'll do the rest of this with jesse if jesus propitiation was able to satisfy and the wrath of God, appease the wrath of God for the not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Why isn't the whole world saved? Because the whole world hasn't reached out and grabbed hold of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. They haven't grabbed hold of the free sentencing of which they've been given, right? Um, for various reasons. Either they don't believe, or they don't see the value of it, or they're still stuck in their own sin that they don't want to walk away from it, or they're just denying the existence of God altogether. I mean, we could go on. There's a multitude of reasons of why people don't reach out and grab the saving grace of Jesus that is there for them. But what he's saying right here is, it is available. This is a really remarkable concept because imagine, see, we take our grace so much for granted just realizing that we can lay back and know that it's there but imagine if there were only 1.3 million tickets of grace that were going to be given out in the history of the world right throughout every generation okay well right now there's like 7 billion people in the world so you would do whatever you could to get a hold of this ticket that's going to save you from the fires of hell but because there is an infinite number of tickets for anyone who would want to um, take advantage, if you will, uh, of the advocate and call him in to their courtroom on their day of trial and say, he is my defense and my defender and just and justifier is Jesus Christ. Now, it's available for any one of us at any time who's done anything or come from anywhere. That is what he's saying. It's, it's exciting for us who are believers, that's what John's saying, but also this is true for everyone. And the word in, in, in theological circles we use is efficacious. It might be uh, it might be a reality for, for one person, but it becomes efficacious, active, effective in the life of another when that person reaches out and grabs hold of it. Um, the way that I would try to explain this to children when I was teaching like eighth grade is I would take out like a $10 bill. I had to take out more than a $1 bill because I, was, I told them I'm going to give this $10 bill to someone. And this $10 bill, by the way, was worth all the $10 that was in this bill because it left a profound impact on the students when the, they would literally get the $10 bill. So I would pull out a $10 bill and I would say, this $10 bill is a good, legitimate $10 bill, okay? And then after I make a big deal out of it, I say, who wants it? Well, every kid raises his hand, right? And some kids, they go crazy, pulling their hair out, they're pushing another kid over, screaming at the top of their lungs. Who really wants it? All right, and then I just, I work them into a total frenzy, right? And then I pick one student, Jimmy, right? And I call Jimmy up and I say, Jimmy, this is yours. And he just looks at me like this. Yeah. And I, it's yours, Jimmy. Yeah. I'm going uh, I'm giving this to you. Yeah. And like, but it, uh, is it yours yet? And then he pauses because I think Jimmy knows where I'm going with the illustration. It's not his yet. 
right? And then I move my hand out like this, and then he goes to take it, and I pull it back, and I say, is it yours yet? And the point I'm making, and of course the whole class, like 30-some kids are watching this, the point I'm making is, even though I called Jimmy, even though Jimmy has come forth, even though I explained all the terms of what it meant and the value of this, and I'm giving it to Jimmy, it does not become Jimmy's until he takes it from me and it then becomes his own, right? So the same thing's true with salvation. You can hear about salvation. You can go to church your whole life and sing Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You can sit and kneel and stand and splash holy water on your face and on your house. You can uh, read, the, read the mass readings. You can work for uh, the lectern. You can do the biblical read. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can wear a huge crucifix and, and big cross earrings and everything else yet you might not have ever in your heart and in the depths of your soul reached out and grabbed the truth of the gospel that Jesus as your advocate has taken your case has taken your sentencing and has taken your charges and has set you free that's when you become a believer when you watch that moment what Christ has done in the message of the gospel and you say I call upon that I own that I lay down my sin and I pick up his forgiveness I pick up his righteousness I pick up his justification I pick up his relationship with his father and I become a co-heir with him I become an adopted son with the father like that's when everything becomes actuated so that's what verse 2 is saying and that's not just true for me as I sit here before you right now that is true for every single person that would hear the message of the gospel and reach out and reach out and just take hold of the truth of that. Here's the gospel. There's a big difference between hearing the gospel and reaching out and actually taking hold of that gospel and then bringing it into your life and then it becomes a reality. It becomes a reality? Yeah, let's watch this one more verse. And by this we know, by this we know, the, the reason that John wrote, is, there's several reasons, but you'll come by this phrase at least three times where he says, by this we know, because there's certain things he wants you to know. Um, he says, by this we know, and he's going to talk about your relationship with Christ. He's going to say, by this we know, and there's a doctrinal component. Here, this is an obedience piece. Relationship, doctrine, obedience. He says, by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Okay, there's, If we keep his commandments, there's evidence that we know him. So, finishing up, you're watching, we're here this morning, and you're looking and you're saying, well, how do I know if that person over there has reached out and has taken hold of that and has brought it into their life? Because we could say that, they might have the earrings, I might see them at church, they're sitting and kneeling, they're singing the song, how do I know? Here's how you know. As nice as all those things may be, and, and they do have their place in worship and tradition, what's most important to God is obedience right and it says it right here in verse 3 here's how you can really know if someone has reached out and grabbed hold of the truth of the gospel and has internalized it into their life is because we keep his commandments so when you see someone that actually hears what God says and follows through on what he does then you would say that person is operating in the sphere of the life of a believer right so if somebody was like like let's just say was in this country but they weren't operating under the laws of the United States of America, you would have to determine that they are not keeping the laws, that they are not part of this country, right? So, in the same way, like, God has commandments. There's a sphere of reality in which God lives and, and desires for us to live, to have the, the fullest life that we can in relationship to Him. And if we're not keeping those commandments, there is no evidence that we actually belong to him. The, what, what ratifies, what verifies, what certifies that we are actually in Christ is the fact that we keep his words, we keep his commandments. Jesus said that too, right? Um, if any man's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And if you believe, as it is spoken in my word, then the streams of water will flow from you. So there's this there's this centered integration, if you will, between believing and actually doing, right? That's where the Holy Spirit is working, is when faith actually, and this is what the whole book of James is about, right? When faith is combined with action, that's when we're seeing that you're a genuine believer. Now, let me say this as we're finishing up. 
you may be a genuine believer because the gavel in this courtroom metaphor the gavel has come down in the courtroom of heaven and you have been declared justified sanctified glorified your sins have been taken and placed upon Christ and you are set free that may have happened in heaven but in the courtroom of men we can't see that that's actually taking place until we can watch your life and see that you're operating in such a way that shows that your charges have been dropped. Right? Um, it, to, to, so to be so to be a believer, let's go with this metaphor. So to be a believer, but not to live out the commandments that God gave, would be as foolish as a person who was a slave, bound hand and foot. To, to be given the keys and yet to hop around and walk with their hands like this, you would say, what are you doing? You've been set free. You have the keys. You've been released. The charges have been dropped. Uh, Jesus took the sentencing, and but you never took off the shackles. If you saw that happen, you would say there's something seriously wrong with that person. right? And so that's what we look like when we say that we have faith and that we've trusted in Christ and we believe that we're forgiven but we're still living in bondage and enslaved to the very sins by which we've been set free right so there's something interesting to think about in all that that's actually a true story some of you know in our history in the United States that when when the declaration went forth that slavery was abolished and the emancipation a proclamation was established that statement was sent into the Southland but there are some places where that message did not reach and when it, and what happened those slaves were still living in slavery to those slavers even though the event look remember the gavel even though the Emancipation Proclamation was established and it was ratified there were still people living in slavery because the truth of that news had come to them how sad is that that there are some people that have the potentiality to be set free and they're still living as slaves to sin. There are some people, listen to this, this is actually true as well. There are some people that received the information of the Emancipation Proclamation and still didn't leave the plantation because they were scared and didn't know where to go or what to do. Slaving was all they ever knew. And because of their fear of the unknown, they decided just to stay exactly where they were. And I'm looking at that and thinking, what a fascinating and also just depressing metaphor of what it's like for someone who's been set free from sin and the proclamation's gone forth, but the thought of living a life that would have to do with walking in the grace of knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, pouring into your forgiveness towards others, all right, and re relieving your own soul of all of its resentment and regret, right, and vengeance and arrogance. The thought of that seems so overwhelming that some people just stay in the, their world of sin, not really able to expand out of that and experience new life in Christ. I'll give you one more example that just comes to mind in this meditation. One of my mentors, Jeff, told me this story decades ago it just never left me it was about um, true story a dog that um, was put it was his friend's dog was um, put inside an electric fence because he loved this dog so much he wanted the dog to be able to roam all over the property so he put the dog on a stake going down to the ground with a chain and he built an electric fence you staked all around the ground, you waited for the professionals to come out, they poured in the cement mix, you put in the posts, you put in these these um, things, and, and so now there's an electric fence on these posts that go all the way around the perimeter of the house, and now there's a, a wall you can't see of electricity that keeps the dog in, right? Most of us have probably seen an electric fence. So the owner goes to let the dog off of the chain so that he can have the whole run of the yard you're set free now the whole yard is yours you can have the entire expanse of the property for which i paid that's how much i love you and when he took the dog off the chain the dog never left the round circle rut that is as far as his chain of bondage would take him isn't that amazing like mentally even though he was set free Yet something in the dog's DNA, he did not want to go beyond the circle 
of dirt that he already created, which went to the extent of his chain. And that's how some of us are living. Like Jesus Christ has set us free by the power of his sinless life and sacrifice being our propitiation, being God's satisfaction when it comes to the penalty for sin upon the life of an individual. And yet we're not tasting, again, the full flavor of that because we're really not walking in his commandments. And we don't walk in his commandments because we haven't taken the time to actually pour into the word of God and see by what we've been set free, how far we've been set free, to what distance can we go now, how high, how far, how deep, how wide, right, is Ephesians, is the love of Christ in this multi-dimensional existence which I now have in Christ and yet I stay within this small limitation because of fear or uh, because uh, the known or my, the, own, the limitations I've placed upon myself, right? So I'm saying, how sad is that? Let, 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 let that not be us today, right? You've been set free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, the Apostle Paul said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I want to encourage you today to go forth and live set free from sin. Live set free from fear. Live set free from bitterness and resentment and hate. Live set free from your own pride and arrogance live set free from the ostracization of other people that tell you you're not allowed to be a part of their group you're a child of the king you are a a, a, a priest and a priestess in the kingdom of god you're a holy nation you are a chosen people uh, the King James says that we are a peculiar people, a particular people, that God has taken out of the darkness and put into the light, right? So, so if God is for me, who can be against me? You get face to face with God today and you recognize the freedom that he's been given to you, that he's given in Christ, and you can get face to face with any crisis today, with any tragedy today, right? With any chaos today, because you've been face to face with God. And you can be, because Jesus Christ has opened the door to give you access right into the presence of the Father. Man. I hope that blesses you today. It blesses me just in the very thought of it. So it's like a great way to start this really beautiful day, right? For those of you who are just getting started. <laughs> There's so much still ahead of us. God bless you guys. I am glad that you came on and were able to enjoy that. Hopefully those metaphors, because we only went a couple verses, but maybe we really nailed down the idea of what it means to have an advocate, what it means that Jesus Christ is the righteous one who is actually qualified to be the one who is our defender in the court room of God. May we understand what propitiation means now, satisfaction and appeasement. We understand that it becomes efficacious, it becomes activated in the life of only those who reach out and grab hold of the grace and internalize it. And the way that we see that reality on earth, even though God has done it spiritually in heaven, the way we see it on earth is by the way we watch one another and we keep his word, we keep his commandments. Well. God willing, Jesse will pick up in verse 4 tomorrow, and we'll see if I'm around too. And God willing, I'd love to be with you as well. Hey, we'd also love for you to be with us at Coastal Christian on Sunday mornings. Please, uh, I'll tell anybody that you can that would be helped by messages like these, where we go verse by verse through the scripture, and we simply are trying to explain what God is saying to his people about grace and forgiveness, about his kindness and his benevolence and his love, right, and his forever home in heaven that he has for us, and his willingness to help us in times of need, and how he is completely and utterly good, and we need to redefine what good means, and how we hope in him, we have confidence in him, we have assurance in him, we're able to face the darkness because of him and acknowledge these shadows that we have in our own lives because of him if you know anyone that would just have a hint of any of this that would help take them and transform them into a life that glorifies God we want them to be in our space and get excited about what God can do in the lives of his people so please invite some people to come with you we'll make sure that we make a parking spot for them we will physically dig out a parking spot for somebody who's bringing anybody to coastal christian because we'd love to see you there